please turn with me now to our text for this week. It's Psalm 139, 13 through 16, and we're going to read this aloud together. So as you find that, let's stand. This then is the text for today. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. May God bless the reading of his word. I want to give you a challenge to begin. Do you think it would be possible when you're sitting at lunch today, whoever you're sitting with or near or across from, to say to them, I am marvelous. <laughs> when you sit down at lunch today, can you look at them and say, my body is wonderful? <laughs> Will you do it? And could you do it without laughing? <laughs> I am marvelous. You'd be quoting scripture when you look across and say, don't you see it? I am marvelously made. I am the handiwork of God. You know, I think we, we struggle with this a, a little bit because when, when often we look at our own bodies we, we look up to God and say, God, did an amateur angel apprentice make my body when you were at lunch? Because Scripture says, I'm wonderfully made, but I see physical foibles all over the place. We, we spend a significant part of our life and our mental energy wrestling with our own physical shortcomings and the preferences which we think are best when it comes to life. All of us have wrestled with things like, I'm too fair complected, I'm too dark complected, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I have the wrong hair color, I have the wrong eye color. And, and when, we, when we look at our lives and we look at our bodies, th this is a common thing of the flesh to look at our reflection in the mirror and see something as lesser than. That for most of us, we are our own worst critic. And when we stare into our eyes in the mirror, we think, I must have been made by an amateur angel apprentice, not by the hand of the Lord God above. Why me? You know, one of the things that we need to work through here is, is the flesh often just views things at a very surface level and misses what's, what's true, misses what's important. You know, one of the things that we see in, in, in the womb when that little baby is forming early on, you know, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, that, that little heart begins to beat. And, and Scripture says it's as if the finger of God is, is pressing down on that little heart, causing it to beat once, twice, and keeps it going. It, it, it tells us that in that three, four, five weeks into life, the digestion system begins to, to digest nutrients from the mother. The, the body begins to form. The, the lungs begin to form. There's this beautiful life that begins to happen, and, and it's all outside of us. It, it, it's all the, the handiwork of God making sure that this life works. It's interesting. There's a, there's a university in Italy, University of Padua, that has 
kept record of human anatomy since the early 1500s. They have a leather-bound book, and every time there's a, a new part of the body that's found, they write in Latin each, each part of the body and up to 1,762 uh, parts of your body. And what Scripture tells us is, is all of those things form because of the sovereignty of God and the power of His Spirit in your life, that in your mother's womb, the, the power of God was put on display as each one of those body parts began to form so that you would live this life that you now live. And it continues on as we're birthed forth into this world. The wonderful systems of our body operate without our input. So we think with our heart just beating. You don't have to set a reminder on your phone for your heart to beat. Right? You don't have to set a reminder so that you breathe. It just goes, the handy work of God happening whether you want it to or not. Right, God begins to, to move and, and work in, in all of these systems of our body, our immune system, our digestive system. Everything works together in this wonderfully complex way that leads to the brilliant lives that we lead. So when we sit across somebody at lunch today and say, I am wonderful, my body is marvelous, we're not saying we're any better than the next guy. I mean, people say that sometimes in untried pride, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? What we're talking about is the hand of God works intimately in the creation of our bodies so that they are. And so this is not about vanity, this is about anatomy, that God has so created you and given you life and given you purpose so that it is contrary to the nature of God and to the word of God when you demean or harm your body. The way scripture talks about the body is this body that we have been given is a gift of God. And, and he created it specifically for you and who you are. And th this body that you have, we, we are to praise God for this body we are to thank him for that which we have been given. And when we demean it or we harm it, we are directly sinning against the ways and word of God. And God is calling us into repentance in that, where we have demeaned and harmed our bodies. God is saying, get on your knees and ask him for forgiveness, and he will restore you and lead you forward into resurrection that you don't deserve into glorified new body that you don't deserve, but by the power of Jesus Christ you may have because of who he is. And in the, in the same way, not only in your own body and in your own self, but when you demean someone else's body or you harm someone else's body, you are sinning against God himself because our bodies, th this flesh that we have been given, it is of God. It is his handiwork so that it is sacred. The physical itself, your physical body, is sacred to God, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you do not have permission from God to demean it or harm it. And any time we harm or demean these bodies or anybody, it is an affront to God and His Word. You do not have permission to harm or demean any body on the face of this earth. They belong to God himself. So we hear that, right? and, and we see creation itself and the way our bodies operate is a miracle of God. But then we also have to hold that in contrast to we see painful decay every single day, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of the people around us. And we have to ask, why then do I experience the physical pain and the physical suffering that I'm experiencing? And the longer we live this life, the greater that pain becomes. And we see the decomposition of our bodies happen in front of that very same mirror that we're looking into. And we ask why, if God formed me and created me and I am wonderful and I am marvelous and I was fearfully made, why then am I experiencing the physical realities that I experience today? So there's a couple of answers to that. So 
On one side of this equation, there are external forces playing against our physical bodies that draw us down. Even gravity itself is pulling us into the grave. And when you have 70 years or 80 years of gravity pulling you down into the grave, it, it affects your body. And it, and it brings pain onto your body. It's, it's similar with, with entropy over time that we are experiencing a kind of decay on this side of eternity that we will not experience in heaven. We are experiencing a decay that goes back to the fall of man in, in Genesis where Adam and Eve sinned and set forth a wave of destruction across time that we still experience today that even the baby in the womb experiences and knows that goes back to that sin in the person of Adam and in the person of Eve that we still know brokenness on the face of this earth because of those decisions they, they've made and many times of sin since then. And so we're, we're experiencing these external forces. So our body is warring against this. Our body is warring against sin and Satan in general. Our, our body is warring against entropy and gravity and those kinds of things, and we're experiencing it. And all of that is pulling us into this, sucking us down into our graves. But then, the painful reality that makes all of this exponentially worse is that we ourselves accelerate that deterioration by our own choices, that our own sinfulness makes this worse. And, and this is where we get into our own way and there's all kinds of sin in our own lives that harms our physical body and then separates us from our God. As we sin, we are separated from God and we feel those effects physically. And physically in our body, physically in our mind and, and we are brought down low because of it. So even if you think about things um, like a, a sin of gluttony, a, a sin of sloth, these kinds of things dramatically affect our bodies over time and, and harm us. And there's all kinds of ways that we choose to harm our own bodies that lessens this life we live. And God says, get down on your knees and repent. And you know, the wonderful promises of scripture is in repentance, God restores. And not only will God restore in eternity where we will know perfection, God begins restoration now that you have new life in this temporal age, in this physical world, God will bring healing and restoration even now before we know it in eternity. Now I think a lot of times we can uh, understand this side of this equation that I have experienced certain things and, and certain pains because of choices I've made. I haven't been good to my body, and I understand that. We, we can see that happen. We, we can see and understand the effects of time on our bodies. We understand that. But, but I think we wrestle more, we struggle more with the question when, when we have the, these little babies and, and they have defects in the womb. Psalm 139 says God is in there working on that baby. How can that baby in the womb have a defect? It's like John 9, we were talking about last week, the man that was born blind, he was blind in the womb. How can that be if Psalm 139 is true? It's, it's also true that um, Amy and I have three daughters. Um, we, we lost a baby uh, after our oldest, between our oldest and our middle. And you have to think, how, how, does, how does this happen? How can, we, how can we lose a baby if the hand of God is in the womb forming them? How is this so? And the, the reality is that, that even in the womb, we are experiencing the effects of sin in this world. That, that the, the effects of, of the fall from, from Adam that, that reverberate down through time, th this little baby even in the womb is in a physical form and, and, and alive in this world. And what that means, the, the, the womb can't protect them from all of that suffering. It can protect them from some, but not all. And, and some in the womb experience deep pain even there. And it's a harsh and painful reality of this earth that we live in. It's, it's the truth of sin. It's, it's the work of Satan. It is, it is suffering that shouldn't be. 
But so it is with the sin of this world. You know, there's a, an economic strategy that really took off in the 1950s, in the 1960s. It's called planned obsolescence. Now, you've probably experienced it if you didn't know what it was. Have you, have you ever experienced when you're, you have warranty on your car and then as soon as the warranty goes out, the car breaks down? <laughs> have you experienced this? It's, it's very popular in the automotive industry. Has been since the 1950s. Same thing with appliance manufacturers. It's, it's a planned process that as soon as the warranty goes out, the refrigerator breaks. Automobiles, appliances, electronics. It's an economic strategy called planned obsolescence. They don't want to build with the highest quality. Now, this, this is the argument that they make. They say it's for your own good. <laughs> and this is what the manufacturers say. We, we have to keep our employees employed. And if your refrigerator lasts 30 years, we're, the whole American economy is going to come crashing to a halt because we can't employ people if your refrigerator lasts 30 years. So your refrigerator is going to have to break at the end of the warranty so we can keep our people employed. So as you buy a new car, a new refrigerator, a new cell phone, you are doing your part to keep the American economy going. This, this is their argument of why they build products with less quality because they want to save the American economy. It's called planned obsolescence. Now, I, I say that to say this, because sometimes it feels like that's what God's doing to us, that God created us to break, that God created us to fall apart as soon as the warranty gave out. Though manufacturing companies have made an art of this, this is not the way and purpose of God. You see, as you work through Psalm 139, you see these verbs in here that God formed you, God made you, God wrought you, God knit you together in your mother's womb. God did not create you so that you would decompose. You know, there are plenty of days in this life where it feels like God created us to die. There are plenty of days where we feel this darkness in our heart and in our minds where we are just breaking down and it seems like every day something else on my body breaks down. And we look up to God and we say, God, why, why does my body break like this? Then we say, God, God did not create you for decay. God created you for his purposes. In fact, if you look down with Psalm 139, 16 with me, the end of our reverse text for this week. These days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. That from the very beginning, God had a plan for your life. And it was a life for life. It wasn't life unto death. It was life into resurrection. It was life into eternity. It was life in relationship with your Savior. God's purpose for you was greater than decomposition. God's purpose for you was relationship in and with his son, Jesus Christ, who will lead you from death into resurrection so that you will know new life. Every day that we experience this kind of decay of the body, we're one step closer to the grave is an opportunity for us to know the power of resurrection and new life in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we long for. And God says, in the spirit, you can have a taste of that today. And there is a day coming when resurrection will be what you know in eternity where all is made perfect, where there is no more pain, there are no more tears, there is no more suffering, that your body is perfected and glorified and you get to live in the perfection of the body that God intended for you. There is a day coming when this is made right and made whole, where the effects of sin are removed, the effects of time and entropy are removed off of your body and you get to live in a perfected, glorified state in heaven and, and Jesus is saying this is coming for you it's in store for you right now in the body and blood of Jesus there is resurrection to be known 
And he's saying, as we live this life, God has a distinct purpose set out for you. And, and he knew it before you were even conceived. Before you were ever known in this world, God knew you. And God knew the plans that he had for you. And this is one of the things that, that we, we fight all the time. That God has a way forward for us where we walk in step with Jesus in this path of resurrection. But our flesh has a tendency to go off course. And any time you step off that course, it is a fight. We, we don't always recognize it that way, but the way you experience this fight is in the decomposition of, of your body and your mind and your heart and your spirit, and, and you start to feel it in your bones. Even if you don't believe in God, you feel this in your bones. Even if you don't trust God, even if you don't know God, when you deviate from that which he has for you, it, it's in your DNA. And so you, you feel it and it wreaks havoc on your body. It wreaks havoc on, on your mind and, and all the different systems of your body. When you are outside of the word and will of God, it is a destructive fight that you will not win. Some people go all the way to the grave with it and they fight all the way to the end and, and that, that pain and that suffering is never relieved. They go from the pain of this world into the pain of hell. But, but the, the power of the resurrection and, and the, the, the wonderful thing about the life of Jesus Christ is you have opportunity to come back to this purpose and this life that God has for you. You, you have an opportunity for restora uh, restoration and resurrection by the body and blood of Jesus. You can come back. You, you can have relief right now by coming back to the way of Jesus Christ. Too many of us are still fighting that. Where, where, we, where, where God has a way for us over here and we're trying to run in this direction and the further you move away from God, the worse that fight's gonna be and it is going to be awful. Physically awful. Spiritually awful. Mentally awful. Most of the anguish that we experience in this life is moving out of the will and word of God. When we find ourselves in the deepest melancholy, most often is because we're distant from our creator. And the further you move away from your creator, the worse it gets. But in his sovereignty, he said there's a way back. And that if you would come to Jesus through the cross into resurrection, you can be restored. And it's where you find the relief that you need. The relief you need this morning is found at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. His physical body, given for the sake of your physical body, if you would only surrender under him as Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, give us your strength this morning. So many of us have spent our lives fighting decay. Lord, would you come and give us relief? Lord, we pray that you'd send your spirit upon us and help us to know what it's like to be renewed day by day. Lord, we pray for every one of us in here. Would you renew us? Renew us in the power of your spirit. Resuscitate us. Give us new breath in our lungs. We need you, Father. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This year, 2024, our theme for the First Baptist family is love your 
neighbor. Now that includes you. We believe when we live out the second greatest commandment, it helps us build meaningful connections with one another. It helps us be more of who God has called us to be as human beings and to join him in what he is doing in all the world. The two simple commands, love God, love your neighbor. Let's do that 2024.